lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. The name of the one who saved us, the Lord Jesus. I'm actually with David Nathan, and we're on our way to our conference in Canada, where we're flying by a SeaTac. And Tony very kindly arranged with your co-equally kind pastor to allow us to stop in and pay you a visit. So it was something of a uh, unexpected event for us, but it was always a pleasure to come uh, to meet new brethren in any, any place the Lord opens the door for that to happen. Um, we don't make a distinction of any kind. I speak in a number of countries, in a number of places, to all kinds of churches, all kinds of, of meetings. But uh, it's always a particularly unique blessing to come to a place where I've not been before. I've been to Seattle, but I've never, never spoken in Seattle before. I live mainly in Great Britain. Despite my accent, I, uh, I was born in New York. I was born just by the Statue of Liberty in New Jersey, but I lived in Manhattan. And I uh, immigrated to Israel when I was a young guy. And uh, my wife, my children are Israeli. My wife's a daughter of Holocaust survivors. Our children are both born in Galilee. Um, and most of my adult life and part of my youth, I've either lived in Israel or Great Britain. I'm almost a stranger when I come to the country of my birth. I'm a stranger in my, my own native homeland. So that's just the way it is. Uh, as a kid growing up, though, I uh, was something of a mixture. I went to a Catholic school and the Jewish community center. I was both sprinkled and clipped. <laughs> I'd become an agnostic, uh, but I got saved when I was in university. And uh, I tell people I'd seen two false religions in my life growing up. One a complete distortion of the Old Testament and the other a complete distortion of the New. But I came to know <laughs> the real Jesus of the Gospel when I was in university. And there's been no looking back ever since with the occasional flaw here and there. So that's my background. And uh, David will tell you about his background tomorrow. He's from South Africa. But tonight I thought what we might do is something I sometimes do. We like to show people how to understand the scriptures from the original perspective, the way the early church would have looked at the scriptures, looking at the Judeo-Christian perspective, not just the Western perspective, but the perspective of how the early church would have looked at the scriptures. And they, of course, initially, Christianity was simply Jewish people who believed that Jesus, Yeshua, was the Messiah. That's what it was. Christendom evolved from that. Most of what's called Christianity today is patristic. It came from the church fathers. It didn't come from the apostles. But we try to gravitate back to looking at the scriptures the way the early Christians were. Everybody has a favorite psalm, but I think if we were to take a straw poll almost anywhere, certainly in the English-speaking world, most people would select Psalm 23. And in the King James Bible, it's absolutely... Um, beautiful for its, po its prose, its poetic language, it really is. There's no question of, of its literary beauty in English. But its literary beauty and spiritual depth in the original Hebrew is much greater than, than what it is even in, in a translation, even in a good translation. Problematically, we get conjured images because of our Western mindset about Psalm 23 and a lot of other things. A couple of times I was in Milan in Italy and I saw the fresco in the Last Supper. It's not actually a painting in a frame, it's on a wall. And Leonardo da Vinci's masterpiece, along with the Mona Lisa, of course, being the, the Last Supper, and it's a magnificent fresco, but it has no resemblance whatsoever to what the Last Supper would have looked like, or been like. The Last Supper would have been celebrated on a low table, three-sided, called the triclinium, and the apostles of Jesus would have been reclining on cushions. There's no resemblance between the Last Supper as a painting and the Last Supper of, 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 of what actually would have transpired in the Gospels. 
So too, I've seen, and maybe you've seen, a nice picture based on Psalm 23 of Jesus in a long red shepherd's frock with a shepherd's crook carrying a little lamb surrounded by his sheep against the background of green rolling hills, mm -hmm. obviously inspired by shepherding lambs in New Zealand or Wales or somewhere. Well, it was not like that in Israel, and it's still not. Biblical anthropologists and certain scholars will still study Bedouin culture because it has changed so little from biblical times. It was not green rolling hills. It was a hostile environment. It was rocky hillsides where there'd be no vegetation or grazing much of the year or where there would be deserts. The shepherds had to leave the sheep according to the annual meteorological cycle, looking for an oasis, looking for an oasis where the sheep could graze and, and be watered. They were trying to survive. Now you're talking about in Fahrenheit, something like 120 degree heat. Sheep covered with wool and secreting lanolin, secreting lanolin. I had to do a little bit of training in the Israeli army when I was younger, but my son was in the army for the full stretch. And in the Israeli army, you carry more weight in in water than you do in bullets. I remember going through the through the uh, Negev Desert with a water container on my back that weighed more than I did, and we would walk a kilometer and run a kilometer. We'd walk a kilometer and run a kilometer, and the sergeants were yelling, Tishte, Tishte, drink, drink. You're always having to drink and rehydrate because of the danger of heat stroke. Well, such it is, it's a very hostile environment, and sheep are not the cleverest of animals head for anything. The most famous oasis in Israel is Ein Gedi, where King David hid from King Saul. Lowest point on the face of the earth is the Dead Sea, totally barren. And of course, whatever changes happened with the story of Lot, it was geophysical changes that happened to that area, we're told in the book of Genesis. It is really, really almost lifeless, except for things you wouldn't want to be around much such as serpents and scorpions. Even microorganisms can not survive in the Dead Sea for the most part. It's the saline content is so high. But there is a stripe coming down a hill, green stripe. You can even see from Jordan, not because it's so big, but because it's the only green you can see. And that is Ein Gedi, where King David hid in the cave from King Saul. And it's a wadi. A wadi is a dried up creek bed that only erupts with water and becomes a flash flood zone during the aftermath of the rainy season. Not too many years ago, two Israeli soldiers were washed away in a wadi and crashed into a boulder and killed. It can be very dangerous. How much more dangerous to a sheep? But a sheep would head straight for the wadi or a sheep would head straight to the Dead Sea, which would obviously kill them if they drank from it. But all they know is it's hot and they're thirsty, and they're secreting lanolin and covered with wool in that climate. And the shepherd has to protect them from their natural inclinations. <laughs> At Ein Gedi, there's nice gazelles and butterflies and birds and things like this, but you've got to go along a overhanging cliff zone with gazelles walking on top of it that cause rocks to fall down. And the shepherds have to, would have to keep the sheep right in the middle, middle, middle point between the wadi and the falling rock zone to get them up to the top. But up to the top where the caves are, where, where Saul hid from, or David hid from King Saul, beautiful, beautiful pond. Gazelles grazing, butterflies, birds. Very beautiful. I used to go there with my wife at that time, my girlfriend. Very romantic place, among other things. And it was very nice up there, <laughs> and still is. That is the more of the image of what it would have been like in Psalm 23. Now, Jesus carrying the little lamb, well, that, that indicates a biblical truth about his character. The good shepherd carries the new believers and things like that. That is true. But the tendency of a lamb would be to wander off, put itself in harm's way of predatory animals. To this day, Bedouins will still do it sometimes, they know the exact joint to break the leg of the lamb, and they have to carry it so it cannot wander off. When it begins to walk, it literally hugs the knees of the shepherd. It stays close to him because it's no longer self-secure. But when the bone tissue 
re-knits. It's as strong as it was before the breaking. So that teaches about the way the Good Shepherd corrects people. Lambs are just curious. They just want to skip off and think they can handle anything, indifferent to the dangers that might befall them. Well, that's the kind of image and environment it was. It's geophysically and meteorologically quite different than that picture of the green and the red. With this in view, let's look, please, if you will, to Psalm 23. We'll read it in English, and then we'll read it in Hebrew. The Psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It could also be translated valley of deep darkness, it could also be, or valley of darkness. Thou dost prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, it sounds nice and everything, and it is nice, but unfortunately, much is lost in translation. So if you'll bear with me, I'll tell you what it really says. Mizmor David, ilo exam. Benaot desha yarbitseni, al mai menuchot in nachalini. Mashi yeshoviev yamchini. The magnet sedek la ma'an shmo. Gam ki elech beget sal mavid lo irara. Ki ata imadi shiftaha umishantaha hema yanachamuni. Ta aroch lefanad shulchan. Neget sorarai, the shanta. The shemen. Roshi kosirebaya. Ech tobe hesed yardifuni kolye mehayai, ve shantivi ve bet yechoa la orech yamim. Let's begin at the beginning. Mizmor le David, a psalm of David. In the Hebrew canon, there are actually three books of psalms, plus there are psalms found in other books of the Tanakh or the Old Testament. Psalms collectively are referred to as Mizmorim. It's more a hymn book of praises, okay? Mizmorim, Miz okay? Um, would be a psalm, like from a hymn book of praises, Mizmor. But all of them together would be called Tehilim, Tehilim. Same root is Hallelujah, Hallelu, Tehalel, to praise, to worship. It was their hymn book. But an in individual one of praise is called a Mizmor. They're not all Psalms of David, but this one, of course, is. Mizmor le David. Let's understand this. King David is the Old Testament shadow of Christ as the Good Shepherd. How good a king of Israel was, was how much like David he was. The kings of Israel in Ezekiel 34 and other passages are called shepherds shepherds of the nation. When we read Kings and Chronicles, if you see it was a good king or a bad king, if it was a bad king, he did not walk before the Lord his God with all his heart as his father David had done. They're always compared to David. Or, <laughs> or he, he did or he didn't. David was the gold standard. David was the one they were all compared to because David is the Old Testament type or shadow of Jesus as Good Shepherd, as Good Shepherd. Uh, again, not every type is equivalent to its anti-type in every aspect. There are obviously differences, major differences between Jesus and David. But David is a type of Jesus, the son of David. In Hebrew, we call Jesus Ben David Yeshua, Jesus, the son of David. Now, a sonship in Hebrew thought does not only indicate biological pedigree. It means in the character of, in the character of. For instance, you know where Peter 
was called by Jesus Shimon Bar Yonah, Simon Bar Jonah in Aramaic. Well, Peter's father may have been called Jonah, but Jesus refers to him as Shimon Bar Yonah. Why? Because at Jaffa, the city of Jaffa near Tel Aviv, the port city, uh, Jonah did not want to go to the Gentiles, remember? And so Peter, in the Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius, he was in Jaffa, he didn't want to go to the Gentiles. He's in that character. He's in that character. So when you see sonship in Hebrew thought, it's not purely pedigree. It means in the character of we're called to be B'nai Tzedek, sons of righteousness, in the character of. Okay. So Ben David Yeshua, Jesus in the character of David. David, the reign of David, when there was peace all around, is a picture of the millennial reign of the Messiah. When he reign, rules the nations with the rod of iron like David did, that is one of the things that foreshadows the millennial reign of Christ. So we see that David is the Old Testament, quintessentially the Old Testament shadow of Christ. How good a king or a shepherd was, was how much like David he was. Because how good a pastor a pastor is, is how much like Jesus he is. This is what Peter is talking about in his epistle. Turn with me, please, if you will, very briefly, to the epistle of 2 Peter. I'm sorry, 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Peter Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder. Notice Peter claimed no primacy. He did not claim to be a pope. He just said he was a fellow leader. This is one of the passages that embarrassed the Roman Catholic Church and why they put the scriptures on the index of banned books for so many centuries. Peter claimed no primacy of any kind and witness of the sufferings of the Messiah, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Escro not for sordid gain. Shepherd the flock. The Hebrew word for shepherd and pastor is the same word, roe. Greek, you can translate it two ways, but the main one would be episcopo. Get the word episcopalian, epi, around, scopo, looking over, like the microscope, periscope, looking over the sheep. Okay. Um, do it voluntarily and not for sordid gain. For some years, I filled prescriptions in Israel five and a half days a week, six days a week, I filled prescriptions. I had a family to support. And I called that a congregation, a small one, in this, well, by Israeli standards, an average one, let's say, at the time, they're bigger now, um, and did evangelism in addition to filling prescriptions. I filled prescriptions because I had a family and I needed to earn a living to support my family and I did it for years. It was about 5% medicine and pharmacology and 95% filling out forms and telling old ladies in Yiddish how many to take because they didn't speak Hebrew. So I did it and that was my job and things like this. If a ministry or a church, if a church or a ministry gets to the size where it needs a full-time pastor, full-time leaders, or it can afford to send out missionaries by all means, perfectly scriptural, but be careful of leaders who will not make pence, who go into the ministry as a job, as a career, as a vocation, or something like that. If somebody will not go into the ministry voluntarily on an unsalaried basis and just do it in addition to their secular job, be careful. This idea that I went to uh, the, the university and became an engineer or a dentist or a teacher and now I should be able to earn my living as a teacher or a dentist or an engineer. That does not apply if you go to seminary, if you did go to seminary. It's not like that. Now it so happens I went to university, then I went to seminary later on when I was a bit older in England, but it's not like that. We don't do these things for any kind of a financial motive. We do it because the Lord has called us to it. Now if the Lord blesses the ministry, the church grows, the ministry grows, as 
room, place for a full-time person, this financial sponsorship for missionaries or whatever, perfectly scriptural. But be careful of these people who come around, how many people are in the church, what's the self? If that's what they're looking at, they're not looking at Jesus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now the term there for sordid gain is actually called filthy lucre in Greek. The word I told you in Greek actually means filthy lucre. Filthy lucre. We've got a big problem in the ministry. Look with me, please, to John chapter 10. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. He who is a hireling and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, beholds the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hireling and is not concerned about the sheep. Now that term snatches them there in Greek is harpezo, same as the word for rapture forcibly snatches away. Same as the word forcibly snatches away. In the last days, everybody's going to get hard paid so. Everybody's going to get snatched away. The people of God are going to be snatched away in a rescue called the rapture, the true people of God. But the others are going to be snatched away by the wicked one, <laughs> the Antichrist. That's what it will come down to. We have three kinds of pastors. We have good shepherds, and those are the ones like Jesus. I have to go back to Vietnam next month where there's a terrible persecution underway right now of the Vietnamese pastors, particularly the mountain people. And I have to go back there. We do secret meetings and seminars for the underground church in Vietnam. Well, I go there to teach those people about the Word of God. They teach me what the Word of God is about. Every one of them has been in prison. They took one guy who was coming to my Bible study, they locked him up, they knocked all of his teeth out. They locked him up for 18 days, and after they abused him conspicuously and disfigured him, they released him so the others would see what they did to him. And then they rearrested him. And I'm supposed to teach him? Well, <laughs> maybe by the grace of God I can teach him about the scriptures. But he teaches me what the scriptures are about. A good shepherd may not have to lay his life down for the sheep in the sense of biological death or martyrdom, but he must be willing to. If somebody is not willing to die for the flock, they're not called to be pastors. I go to places where that can be the reality. Well, that can be the reality. This is not just for the ancient world. More Christians have been persecuted in the last 50 to 60 years than in all the history of the church combined put together. It's the reality. So we have good shepherds who are like Jesus. They will lay their life down for the sheep. And of course, that doesn't only mean to die biologically. It means to fill prescriptions. <laughs> Six days a week, in my case, you lay your life down for the sheep. The second are wolves in sheep's clothing. Fortunately, most pastors are not wolves in sheep's clothing. Some are. Certainly the money preachers you see on TV, the heretical money preachers, their God is mammon. They're calling the sin of covetousness faith. And they're teaching faith in faith, not faith in Jesus. Those people are wolves in sheep's clothing, as one example. That's true. But then there's the third category. The third category of pastors are the hirelings. They're in it because it's their job. They're in it because it's their ministry. Well, Jesus said the easiest way to identify a hireling is this. They will not protect the sheep from the wolves. They will not protect the sheep from the wolves. They'll allow any kind of false doctrine, false teaching to get in, sheep fleecing. Just don't lock the boat. They're there for them. They're not there for the Lord or for the, for the sheep. If they will not protect the sheep from the wolves, if they will not keep false doctrine and heresy out of the church, particularly in these last days, <coughs> they're a hireling. They're a hireling. And they always have these excuses that are not scriptural. We just need to teach the truth. The Lord will address the error. In that case, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and Galatians never should have been written. Neither should most of the Hebrew prophets ever written their books. It's just not scriptural. It sounds very nice and religious, but those are the words of violence, not shepherds. 
So let me go back to what Peter said in chapter 5 of 1 Peter. Nor lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Like martyrs, pastors receive a crown of glory. A martyr dies for, dies for what he believes. A pastor has to be willing to he had a similar reward. Okay. But look at it carefully again. Proving to be examples. Leadership in scripture is not just telling people, it's showing people by your own example. Jesus never told the apostles to do anything. He didn't do himself. Leadership is not simply by expounding the scriptures. It is by allowing the sheep to see the scriptures put into action in your own life. That's how biblical leadership works. Well, look more carefully. Not lording it over them. Again, we go back to Ezekiel 34. God hates heavy shepherding. God hates heavy shepherding. There are different theories as to who and what they were. I can tell you what the various theories are. But nobody knows for sure who the Nicolaitans were. We know that Jesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, and we know what the term means in Greek. Nikolaiti, suppression of the people. It's where you have a clergy class that set themselves over the people the way the Sanhedrin did. Who are you to question us? Yeah, but this isn't scriptural. You have a spirit of rebellion. Who are you to well, there may be people who have a spirit of rebellion, but it's not the people who are following the Lord on the basis of Scripture. <laughs> the Lord hates heavy shepherding. He hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Whenever you see heavy shepherding, you're going to find exploitation. These days, you'll very often also find sexploitation. Predatory behavior and vulnerable. Uh, and you're certainly going to find false doctrine and false teaching. These things are not good. David was not like that. When David got it wrong, when he numbered the people where God didn't tell him to, he began building his own empire instead of God's kingdom. Remember? And the judgment of God fell. David said, Lord, I'm responsible, not the people. He took the blame for what he did. David is the Old Testament standard, the picture of Christ. How much like Jesus a pastor is is how good of a pastor he is. How less like Jesus he is is how bad of a pastor he is. So we begin these more the David, a psalm of David. It continues. Yehovah ro'i, lo exar. It does not say, the Lord is my shepherd. It says no such thing. Cross that out. That's wrong. It says, Yahweh is my shepherd. It's a Christological statement. It points to the deity of Christ. It points to the deity of the Messiah. Yehovah ro'i. It points to his deity. Lo exar. Not that I shall not want. I shall not lack in Hebrew. Lo exar in the Hebrew has said. I shall not lack. I shall not lack the things the shepherd knows I need. Who knows what's better for a baby? A baby or a pediatrician? <laughs> Who knows what's better for a cocker spaniel? The cocker spaniel or a veterinarian? Who knows what's better for us? Us or Jesus? We shall not lack the things he knows we need. He meets our needs in his way, on his terms. Next to quiet waters. The quiet waters, the quiet waters have to be understood in contrast to the wadis with the fast rushing water. Remember, water outpoured 
consumable water called Maim Hayim in Hebrew. Maim Hayim is a picture of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. We get this in John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39. I'll give you Maim Hayim, but this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. He told the woman at the well in John 4, I'll give you Maim Hayim, living water. It's the Holy Spirit. This comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 3, and various other passages in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. It's a picture of the Spirit. Sheep were rather dumb, easily excitable and nervous. When they see water, they'll head for it. Oh, we're going through a dry spell. There hasn't been a revival in 50 years. As soon as they see something they're told is a revival, they'll get on the next airplane to Toronto, Canada, or, or, or Pensacola, Florida, to some deception, some counterfeit that is obviously nothing to do with any biblical or historical pattern of revival. They'll go to some counterfeit. Cheap don't know. They'll just head for the nearest source of water. They'll go to the rushing water, not to the water still. The fruit of the Spirit is a crete. We're told that quite twice in the New Testament. Self-control. When you see people out of control and going ballistic and think, that can't, oh, I know it was the Holy Spirit. I couldn't control it. But the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. When you couldn't control it, that proves prima facie. That's not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I saw one of these guys yelling, when the Spirit comes on me, hallelujah, I have to prophesy. You have to prophesy? The spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. I'm not talking about suppressing the Holy Spirit, but I am talking about suppressing the counterfeits of the Holy Spirit. The waters are always calm, drinkable, safe. They don't crush and destroy people. They won't wash a sheep away into a boulder and get it killed and crushed. Neither will they drink the poison waters of the Dead Sea. The shepherd has to keep them away from it. Get over that. Some sheep. I told you not to go to Lakeland. <coughs> they actually had a tattooed goon kicking old ladies in the face saying it was a revival. And people believed it. A shepherd will keep a sheep away from that. Those are not the water still. That's not the water of the Spirit. And that's not to say that when God's Spirit moves, it's not exciting. It can be very exciting. But it's not manic, <laughs> it's not lunacy. Well, let's look. Verse 3. Nafshi Yeshoviyev Yankini. The Makale Tzedek Lama'an Shmo. The Makale Tzedek. Again, it's translated, He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The Hebrew term to restore is lechadesh, lechadesh. Same as to renew, hadash, new. It's not the word there. Forget about he restoreth my soul. Take that out. It's completely wrong. He causes my soul to repent. Yeshoviev from Teshuvah. The way that the Lord restores us emotionally is by restoring us spiritually. The way he restores us spiritually is he causes us to repent. And he does this in the circles of righteousness. Now there are two ways that scholars interpret these circles of righteousness. One is a circular path up a mountain if it happens to have a pond or an oasis on top of it. But <coughs> the shepherds to this day, the Bedouins will do it. They'll build fires around the periphery of where the sheep are grazing before it gets dark. And they will draw a big circle with a staff. Because not only is there dangers of predatory animals who are terrestrial, but the serpents will burrow underneath and ambush the sheep. Okay. Serpents bite. And they'll Man, they'll take turns manning the periphery, patrolling it at night, watching to see if a serpent burrows underneath him. <laughs> Be careful of people who are out of fellowship. 
There are those, I was just in Saudi Arabia recently, God bless them. There are people who are out of fellowship because there is no fellowship. And if there was, they'd find themselves arrested immediately. The Lord will take care of his people. But be careful of people who remain out of fellowship. If you cannot find a biblically based church, meet in a home. Forsake not the fellowshipping together, one with another, especially as you see the day approaching, especially in the last days. Now this is a principle of something called Jewish Midrash that St. Paul used called Kal Vahomer, light to heavy. Something that's always true as a general truth in a light situation takes on an expanded or amplified dimension of importance in a heavy situation. The last days, if we can't survive individually, uh, it, 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 in fellowship, we're never going to survive individually. Forsake not the fellowship together. It is in the circles of righteousness where the Lord restores our soul. You're on your way to church Sunday morning and your unsaved husband picks an argument with you about something stupid. Your bachelor and children were out the night before. God knows who doing who knows what. Terrible morning, you finally get to church and you're late, you walk through the door and everybody is singing the hymns and the Spirit of God is moving and you feel like you just crawled out of a gutter. Because in a matter of speaking, you did. That's precisely what happened to you. You feel so far and estranged from the Lord. You don't feel too spiritual. Well, feelings are emotional. How does the Lord restore our soul? That's feeling emotion. By causing us to repent in the circle of righteousness. I want to get into this group. I want to worship the Lord. I want to be in fellowship with other people who are worshiping him in spirit and in truth. He causes our soul to repent. He causes our soul to repent. Yeshoviev. It's not he restores. He causes our souls to repent. Once that happens, the restoration is automatic. Forget about psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is for psychos. Unless you're dealing with the spiritual dimension of man, psychology isn't going to help them. <laughs> Secular psychology isn't going to help anybody beyond a very limited point. The Lord changes people from the inside out. He restores people psychologically and emotionally by beginning with the innermost man or woman. And that's what it's telling us. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. But it's something, Lama'an Shmo. He does it for his own namesake. Even when Israel sinned and God still blessed them and used them, he would sometimes give them victory over the Philistine or the invader for his own namesake, for his own glory. The Lord will sometimes use us when we are not deserving of him to use us. He will bless us when we are not deserving of his blessing. But he will always do good for us when he does good for us for his own namesake. Just think, we're the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. No one hates his own body, Paul writes. Okay. The Lord does good for us as if he's doing it for himself. Because we are his body. You're thirsty, you drink. You're hungry, you eat. You're tired, you sleep. You do good for your own body. Well, we're the body of Christ. He does good for us as if he's doing it for himself because we are his body. Quite a thing, isn't it? Now, there's more to it than this. I'm just highlighting the main point. To understand the way we're his body, we have to understand Ephesians, the metaphor of marriage, the husband and wife becoming one. Her body becomes his, his body becomes, that's how the church can be his body, the metaphor of marriage, the church being the bride of the bridegroom. But again, I only mention these things in passing. Let's continue looking at the next verse. As we translate it, for even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Again, the valley of darkness or deep dark. Most of us would have a tendency to apply this to giving up the ghost. Well, 
that's true. I suppose it's a fair application. Remember, there are many mysteries in Scripture, many mysteries. The mystery of the gospel, there's good mysteries. There's the mystery of iniquity, there's bad mysteries. There's the mystery of the rapture, behold, I tell you a mystery, many mysteries. But biological death is not one of them. God has never defined death as a mystery. We mystified it. It's something great unknown. You want to know what you're going to see, look at the martyr to Stephen. He saw Jesus coming forward. That's what you're going to see. There's no mystery. There's no mystery to it at all. You wonder what's going to happen when we read the book of Revelation. There's no mystery to it. Now, it's a mystery to the world, to the unsaved. It's all this mysterious thing. The great unknown. It's no mystery to us. Okay. It's not this darkness. For the believer, it's light. First thing we're going to see is Jesus. Second thing we're going to see is our dead loved ones, you know, who died in Christ. You know, I always tell Christians, you know, your husband died. Well, I'm sorry for your temporary loss, but I'm just sworn I like the temporary. I always tell, they ask, the people ask me to do eulogies and things like that. And I say, all right, listen, I'll do the eulogy on the one condition. You let me write the epitaph. So what's the epitaph on the headstone? Temporarily closed for renovations, will reopen soon. John 5, 24. When you come back here, don't look down, look up. That's where he or she's coming from. Don't look down, look up. Don't look up. Don't look up. Don't look up. That's where we read off. Temporarily closed for renovations. For the believer, there's no death. Jesus died our death to give us his life. There's no death. The scripture never speaks of the death of believers. Death, always asleep. You go to sleep, you wake up again. And your consciousness enters a different sphere. You're in the conscious presence of the Lord when you give up the ghost. Now, for the unsaved, it's something different. For non-believers, it's something different. They got a big problem. And they have a big problem with no solution. But for us, it's not death. There's only, for the believer, there's no death. There's only life. And it's not dark, it's light. For those who are impressed. For those who are really impressed. So this valley of the shadow of death, again, it's this world that's dark. <laughs> it's the dangers of this world, it's the falling rock zone at I'm Getty. It's the wadi on one side and the falling rocks on the other. Now the shadow. The shadow can't hurt you because a shadow has no substance. A shadow can't hurt anybody. A shadow has no substance and no capacity to hurt anybody. No need to be afraid of a shadow. But a shadow tells you that there's something nearby that can hurt you. You stay with the shepherd. You don't have to be afraid of what's causing that shadow. You walk with Jesus. You don't have to be afraid of anything. He's not going to let you go anywhere. He hasn't been himself. And he's not going to let you go anywhere or me anywhere. Well, he's not going to go with us. And again, I'm speaking about the believer. He's not going to let us go anywhere. Not even to a concentration camp. He's not going to let, like Corey Temple, wonderful story, if you ever want to read the hiding place. I recommend that book to anybody, any Christian. He's not going to let us go anyplace that he hasn't been himself. And he's not going to let us go anyplace. He's not going to be there with us. The shadow can't hurt anybody. It has no substance. You stay by the shepherd. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. We all have our own shadows of death. For me, it's an MRI machine. My nose has never itched except when I'm in that <laughs> <laughs> I was never claustrophobic until somebody invented that thing. <laughs> I just hate it. Turn the music up. When I when I think I, I, I pray. <laughs> it's just life. We live in a fallen world. Well, let's continue. Let's look at this more carefully. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. Shivtacha umeshantacha. Notice it puts the rod first and the staff second. Most scholars think it's the same instrument 
shepherd's crook applied two different ways. Puts the rod first. We all like to put the staff first. What a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> we can lean on Jesus. That's the staff. That's true. But it puts the rod first, clunking us over the head. You stupid sheep, I told you not to do that. What? <laughs> you know you used to be a drunk before I saved you? What are you going at the Clancy Saloon for? What? <laughs> Thou shalt not come in. What are you doing in that race truck? What? <laughs> Everybody's got something. Everybody's got something. The correction of the Lord. He only corrects his children. The correction of the Lord in our lives is just as emblematic of his love for us and indicative of the fact that we belong to him as is the staff that we lean on. The correction, and it puts the correction of the Lord first. He's trying to get us out of this place in its present state. I'm premillennial. I believe the meek will inherit the earth literally. But in its present state, he's trying to get us out of here and keep us safe while we're here. The correction of the Lord in our lives as believers is just as indicative and emblematic of his love for us and the fact that we belong to him as is the fact that we can rely on him and trust him and lean on him during times of trial and difficulty or whatever. Puts the rod first. That's quite interesting. Then it continues. Verse 5, it begins to become pastoral. Pastoral, to do with Passover. 1 Corinthians is the most pastoral of the epistles. It explains the relationship between the Passover and the Lord's Supper. But I'll read this in Hebrew and explain it word by word. Ta'aruch lefanab shulchan. Neged Soranai, the Shanta Beshemen, Roshi, my head, Kosi Rebaya. We mistranslated, Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Thou dost prepare a table for me against the one who causes me trouble. Sorai, you know the Yiddish word sorus. The David's a nice Jewish word. What sorus? Troubles. Troubles of life. Sorus. You know what Peter says? Don't be uh, alarmed or don't be uh, surprised. When everything begins to go wrong, as if some strange thing were happening. The devil goes around like a roaring lion, with all the circumstances of life thrown against you. This is sorus, and the devil orchestrates sorus against believers both corporately and individually. He's the one who causes us trouble. Now, I'm not going to go into it now, but there are Old Testament passages that speak fairly extensively about the judgment of Satan. And he's going to, he is going to be judged for everything he did to every one of us. <laughs> the judgment of Satan will include <laughs> him being eternally judged for everything he ever did to every one of us, as well as to all of us corporately quite a thing. Right? No wonder he doesn't like us. Anyway, the Lord prepares a table for us in the presence of the one who causes us trouble. In the Passover, Jewish people, as your pastor will tell you, look back and they look forward. They look back to the liberation under Moses from Egypt, and they look forward to the coming redemption of the Messiah. We are the same. Our Paschal meal is the Lord's Supper. We look back, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a looking back and a looking forward. Now understand the restoring of the soul. We are told in this Paschal epistle of 1 Corinthians chapter Five about something called the Bedichat Chametz, 
the day before the Passover meal, your wife has to clean everything, you know, spring cleaning, clean everything containing leaven out of the house. Leaven is a figure of sin, especially the seminal sin of pride, which causes other sin. Satan's first sin was pride, he wanted to be God. Pan's first sin was pride, he wanted to be God. Paul says, your boasting is not good. Clean out the leaven, the old leaven of malice and wickedness. You see a person with a problem with greed, under that greed is pride. You see a person with a problem with lust, under that lust is pride. You see a person with a problem of unrighteous anger, under that unrighteous anger is pride. Pride is the sin that begets other sin. The leaven, chometz, uh, contributes nothing to the nutritional value of the bread. It only puffs it up. <laughs> Clean out the leaven. He restores our soul. If we come to the Lord's table with unconfessed sin, we can eat and drink judgment to ourselves. That is why the early Christians took the Lord's Supper regularly. Just like Jewish people have Kiddush Shabbat every Friday, they have a little Passover every week. Believers are to have a regular Passover. It keeps us in repentance mode. We can eat and drink judgment unto ourselves. You can actually reduce your longevity if you take the Lord's Supper with unconfessed sin and repeatedly. You can actually reduce your longevity. You better keep repenting before you eat that thing. Put things right with the Lord and if necessary with each other when it's within our capacity to do so. This is it. This is a big meaning. It is most unfortunate that there are some churches that only do the Lord's Supper periodically. Some of them do it once a year or once a quarter. That's not scriptural. It's not scriptural at all. Uh, not at all. It's really important. It's the table in the wilderness. It's a memorial of what he did do, but it's a foretaste of what he's going to do. It is an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay? The Lord's Supper is, yes, it's a memorial meal, Again, this is an indictment of the era of the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Mass, who say it's the same as Calvary. No, what Jesus would have said was, Do this in remembrance of me. This blood poured out the remembrance. The Passover is a remembrance. It's not the same sacrifice as Calvary as the Church of Rome came to teach. When you understand the Jewish background of the Lord's Supper and how it comes from the Paschal Seder, you see the folly of the Mass and how true it is. But nonetheless, it's also a looking forward. It is an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb against the one who causes us trouble. Right now, right now, the table is being set in heaven in eternity for the marriage supper of the Lamb. It says, I'm going to put Tony over there and Jacob over there and David Nathan over there and Pastor Wyman over there. And the devil's standing there. You're not invited. Beat it. Guess where you're going? My cup floweth over. This is the cup of blessing from the Paschal Seder. The wine is being poured out. He gets a different kind of wine. Cup of God's wrath, the dregs of the book of Revelation. Again, it's, you'd have to explain the Passover. To, you have a Jewish pastor, he can tell it to you. You count out the plagues on Egypt. Those plagues on Egypt are replayed in the Paschal Seder. Choshek, darkness, frogs, fardaya, bomb, blood. And you fill up a saucer, but it's actually called the cup in the Hebrew liturgy. Well, that's the cup of wrath in the book of Revelation. That, that's, what, that's for the enemies of God. The cup of blessing is for his people than the cup of acceptance. Satan sees what the Lord has prepared and is preparing for, for his people at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's not in the presence of our enemy, it's against the one who causes us trouble. Satan sees what the Lord is doing and is preparing for us, and he knows what the Lord is preparing for him. He's desperate. And of course, desperate individuals will do desperate things. Everybody understand? Mm -hmm. You take the Lord's Supper. Yes, it's a memorial of what he did do. But it is a testimony of what he shall do. It's an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. Well, let's continue this a little bit. I'd like to talk about the 
the Poncho Lounge. One of the things our ministry does is we have children's missions. Our, our main one now is in the Philippines. We're opening one in India, Lord willing, next year. And we support one in Uganda. But our first one was in South Africa. And when I had to go for AIDS kids, and when I had to go to South Africa, I'd go to the airport, the Heathrow Airport in London, usually. <clears throat> and there's a departure lounge for the passengers going to South Africa, to Cape Town, or to Johannesburg. And you go in there, and I get to the airport, and I got all this stuff. Well, let's see. Oh, I've got to get some RAND. I've got to change money. Where's the Bureau of the Charge, the American Express? I've got to do the financial thing. So I do that. Let's see. I've got to buy presents for the kids. Where's the duty free? I've got to do the commercial thing. I've got to buy the presents for the kids. Well, let's see. I'm going up, uh, going up uh, the KwaZulu Natal and North. Larry, I gotta get some Larry, and I gotta go to the airport pharmacy or clinic and get some Larry because of malaria. Yeah, you gotta do the health thing. Health thing, financial thing, you know, uh, commercial thing. Well, listen, I gotta do some work. Where's the business lounge? I can't wait to get all that stuff over with. Because once I do all that stuff, I go into the departure lounge. And the departure lounge, there's nice posters of like Cape Town, the Cape of Good Hope, one of the prettiest cities in the world. David was born there, but it's actually one of the, in terms of natural landscape, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, possibly the most beautiful. And uh, pictures of Zulu warriors and native headdress and wild game like elephant and rhino, and you see them in their natural habitat. It's not like seeing them in a zoo or a safari park. It's completely different, much more spectacular. But you go in there, and there's a smorgasbord of South African cuisine, Crook Sisters, butternut soup, and wines from the Cape. And you get a foretaste of what you're going to be eating. And they have a selection of literature about what you're going to be seeing when you get there. And not least of all, you with other people go into the same place. Now, you're either going to say, for well, all passengers to Cape Town, please report to gate G17. Or they're going to say, well, Jacob Flash, please report via your flight to Cape Town to get G17. Might be going individually, might be going all together. This is a departure lunch. Out there's the world. <laughs> you got to do the financial thing. Right? You got to go buy stuff in the mall. You got to go to work. You, know, you got to do the business thing. You know, you got to do the commercial thing. You got to go to the mall. And you got to go to work. And then you gotta go to the health thing, to the pharmacy, the clinic, or whatever. You gotta do all that. But when I get in here, I'm in the departure lounge. <laughs> when I take the Lord's Supper, I have an appetizer of the cuisine when I'm going. I have literature that tells me about what's waiting for me. I'm gonna run to the fight. And I'm hanging out with people going to the same place I am. I don't know if the Lord's going to say, Jacob Prash, come on home. Or if he's going to say, all passengers who've been saved by the blood of Jesus for being raptured out of here, let's go. He may come for us individually, or he may come for us corporately. But we're all going to the same place. This might look like a church, but this is a That graveyard out there, we gotta deal with it. But don't worry, its days are numbered. Our days are without number. Remember, for unsaved people, the older an unsaved person gets, the less they have to live for. The older a believer gets, the more they have to live for. The older somebody gets biologically, the less they have to live for if they're unsaved. The older you get biologically, the more you have to live for if you're saved, not the less, that's for the world. I just think, just think of a funeral. The loss of a believer, it's, it's temporary. You'll see grief and mourning. There's love that has to be. But I've never seen despair at the funeral of a true believer. I've seen loss and mourning, grief, I've seen those things, it's just natural. 
But the scriptures say, do not be overly grieved for those who are asleep. They're not dead, they're asleep. You see it from God's perspective, from the real perspective. Remember, biological death and biological birth are perfunctorial. Real birth is second birth. And real death is for the unsaved. That's the second death. If you have the second birth, you escape the second death. Real birth and real death are the second birth and the second death. It doesn't do, if you have the second birth, the sec, second death, that's for the world. For them, their troubles begin at the grave. For us, our troubles end there. Their life ends at the grave. Our life begins there. When I see people say, oh, my dear husband, Henry, he was such a wonderful man. <laughs> he snubbed him. Okay. I wish he would be back for one hour so I could tell him how much I love him. Lady, you're going to have him back on this earth, alive and healthy, for a thousand years. Then you can drive him nuts all you want. <laughs> and then we're going to heaven. Don't look at life and death from the perspective of the world. Don't look at old age from the perspective of the world. Don't look at frail health from the perspective of the world. Even I'm gonna be good looking. <laughs> <laughs> He's preparing the table. This is a departure lounge. I even get a little appetizer of what's waiting for us. So do you. The last verse. Psalm 23. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Again, not the best translation, but it's not easy to translate, so I'll do my best. Ech tov vechesed, yor bifuni kol yemei hayai, v'shati bebet yecholad ha'orach. How good is the mercy? Chesed is the Hebrew word for grace, but it means God's mercy in the cup. How good is the grace or the merciful grace? How good is it? It's exclamatory. That chases after me. It's like the word a hunter pursuing its prey, it chases after me. The Lord is looking, chasing after us to cast his grace upon us. If you ever want to read a great book after the scripture, you can read the P Pilgrim's Progress. After the scripture, that's the best book I ever read in my life is the Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. And the guy was there, and every time the flame was going out, there was a guy in the back of him with the oil can making the flame go up again. I love that book. After the scripture is the best thing I've read in my life. But anyway, chases after us. Kol yemei hayai. Let me explain this. Eternity in Hebrew is olame olamim, from age to ages, okay, or from world to world, so olame olamim, it's about the eternity. In Greek, its equivalent is enyam tal enyames, okay, enyam tal enyames in Greek. But here, it's kol yamei hayai, all the days of my life. This is God chasing after us. You know, I've got a grandson, I love him. Little Jewish baby in England. Born to my daughter and her husband, nice Jewish boy. And uh, his, name is, his name is Joshua Isaac. And uh, I can't wait to see him. Every, I can't wait to do good for him. Any day, when's his birthday, when's Hanukkah? Any excuse just to do good for him. That's just a little hint of the love. God created that kind of love to teach how much he loves us. It doesn't just mean in eternity. It means in this life. And it doesn't just mean in this life. 
It means in eternity. It's all inclusive. It'll be with us now and forever. That's what it is. Echtov. How good. How good. And so we read. He's born to David. A son of David. Yehovah ro'i lo etzah. God is my pastor. I will not lack the things he knows. Benaot desha yardifuni. Kol yardifuni. Almay menuchot yenachalini. Nafshi yeshobi yev yancheni. Ben magalet sedek lema'an shmo. Gan ki elek begeit salmavet lo irara. Ki ata imadi. of Yeshua, because of Jesus, we will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. God bless and thank you for joining us this evening. Hola, bienvenidos en Cristo. Yo soy Jacobo Paraste Muriel, with the Ministerio Muriel, con las versiones de Biblia, en español y también en inglés. Nosotros tenemos una website en español para lecciones de Biblia a Jesucristo, porque Jesús viene pronto, son pocos años. Vaya con Dios, hermanos y hermanas. Bye.